Welcome to the Business Resilience Decoded podcast, brought to you by Asfalis Advisors and the Disaster Recovery Journal. Crisis management in today's world is ever-changing, and this podcast is our commitment to help you navigate successful outcomes for any crisis you may face. I'm your host, Vanessa Matthews. I specialize in providing insights and solutions for crisis, continuity, and resilience across industries from real estate and healthcare to terrorism in the airline and transportation worlds. No matter what industry you're in, this podcast will provide you the tools to build resilience in your organization. Welcome back to another episode of the Business Resilience Decoded podcast. I am your host, Vanessa Matthews, and today we're going to be talking about the impact of ESG on business continuity and resilience. ESG, which stands for Environmental, Social, and Governance Investing, is a way for your investors to evaluate risk and social responsibility before making an investment within your organization. In this episode, we'll be sharing some of the specifics of ESG and how it can affect your specific resilience or continuity practices and decisions and how you might consider strengthening um, that relationship between those functions within your business. So first, let's drill into those three pillars, and we'll start with environmental. Environmental impacts can include all of the things from a sustainability perspective for your company, which may look like using renewable energy sources. It could look like crafting uh, uh, products and sustainable recyclable materials or reducing your carbon footprint. The second element of ESG um, can look like how you encompass your business initiatives to support e- equity or inclusion or human rights for your employees, your customers, or even within your supply chains. So for example, maybe you are sourcing from factories where workers are over the age of 18 and are paid a livable wage, right? How do you ensure that those things are happening to make sure that it's a sustainable approach, but also one that is lending to better and fair wages for people from a global perspective? It could be supporting certain rights. It could be from an LGBTQ perspective or for other demographics within the world um, and or encouraging uh, gender or racial equality within your workforce and globally. From a governance standpoint, this is all about how you run your business, right? And that can include your org chart, your board structure, um, some examples of a ESG conscious governance perspective Um, ensures that you have diversity on your board, that you are appointing a board chairman who's not just your CEO, Um, eliminating corrupt business practices such as bribery. I did a talk a couple of years ago about open board seats, and it was published that there were like 279 board seats that were made available. And of those 279, like less than 1% went to African-American women, less than like 0.1% went to Hispanic women and Asian women. And so when we talk about even promoting women from a board perspective, what women are we talking about? And so being clear about not just filling board seats um, with particularly white women, as this study highlighted, but also looking across the the spectrum of who we have at the table and who who we are recruiting from a board seat uh, perspective to add the diversity that we need to at a board level. So I went to and hosted a recent executive leadership roundtable in Charlotte with a couple of great leaders, and the topic of ESG came up. And this table and this boardroom had representatives from a vice president and chief level group of people from various industries, from higher education to supply chain, uh, to nonprofit leadership, to healthcare leadership. Um, technology leaders. Um, And what was interesting was how those different aspects of ESG shows up in their roles. Some of them were presidents, some of them were heads of HR, some of them were heads of IT, some of them were heads of enterprise risk. Um, And some of them were even corporate directors who have a different view on the ESG landscape. And so I wanted to share with you a couple of things that came up and then walk into a couple of specifics about things that you might be able to leverage from a resilience and business continuity perspective as an application. And so one of those things that we learned is that some companies um, view ESG as a sustainability risk, and it is an annual report um, that is circulated and that there are processes and systems in place for how they have to manage it, track it, 
and mitigate it and also have to build it into their requirements. Um, if you might be a Fortune 50 or Fortune 10 company, you might be very um, mature in your processes and, and systems for how you run this. And some, or, some organizations who may not be at that level may have a different aspect of maturity. And that came out in the executive roundtable discussion that we hosted. One of the other components that came up as what companies are doing around ESG is keeping an eye on small and minority owned businesses and how they actively participate and do business with these organizations. Um, ensuring that they are providing um, financial support and creating opportunities to do business with what some might term NWSBE, so Minority Women Small Business Enterprises, um, creating intentional support or sometimes even mentorship opportunities is what some, or some organizations spoke of. Some legislation uh, recently and some of the lawsuits around that, that diversity and inclusion have been created to continue to exclude people of color from being able to participate in contracting processes. And so this is something that came up as a part of that ESG discussion that some corporations are paying attention to, to keep their word and to also make sure that they're doing their due diligence. Because of what's happening from a political perspective and how governance and social aspects of, of ESG are being politicized, some corporations have been a bit gun shy around DEI and ESG. But what we learned is that those investors from those corporations still expect these policies to be in place and to not change. Where the conversation took us to <clears throat> is in the next 18 to 24 months, specifically from a US perspective. Um, we're currently looking at uh, December of 2023 right now, the world um, will change and continue to adjust. And so that also will be impacted by what happens from a U.S. presidency perspective, what happens in the world with the wars um, that are currently going on with Russia, Ukraine, as well as Hamas and other things that are happening from a global standpoint. And so they're really paying attention to the next 18 to 24 months as it relates specifically to ESG. One thing that also came up around this, this conversation was the need for diverse talent is something that will not change no matter what happens and how companies are looking at that as a ESG priority for their business. Um, they also talked about safety goals are not going to, to go away from an ESG perspective. And so um, ensuring that there's still programming and systems in place to support that. Equity. Um, from these leaders' perspectives will not go away um, because it makes an impact and they've seen it from a bottom line perspective in their business. And so what they also talked about from that vantage point is some, some verticals or some business units or some companies are focused on equity, but they have to do so quietly um, and not sharing the impact of those successes given what we're seeing just purely from an academic perspective and what's happened across this country and so they're dealing with it in, in different ways. What was really important was that from a corporate director standpoint, which was, it was really valuable to have that representation at the executive leadership roundtable that we hosted in Charlotte, was that their view on the younger talent and their view on what needs to continue to happen internally at a corporate level. Um, their perspective was that diversity must take place in order to sustain a workforce or a workplace you cannot you know, build a company without diversity and diversity is more than just what you see, right? And so the million dollar question and maybe the billion dollar question is, does your company want to be there where you're a high performing organization that's gonna sustain the future? And if so, how are you gonna cater to the modalities of different types of talent? Um, the conversation talked a lot about our youth and how those different aspects of youth and different generations are asking the tough questions of business leaders and they're prepared to hold them accountable more so than previous generations have been in the past. Um, and they're also more socially aware, right? And so they understand when you're um, speaking truth, when you're supporting an organization because you really value what they're, um, you know, what they're doing in the world and the impact that they're making when it's just lip service. And so um, what came up as a part of that, as I close this out, is that the recommendation was as business leaders, um, we have to be prepared to seek the real answers and not the answers that we want to hear, which means we have to also be, be prepared to provide a, a real response and not just lip service that people um, don't want to hear.
And so as we think about ESG, what those things mean, we talked about a couple of examples and how that can show up in your business. We talked about real-time examples of what we've recently learned at an executive leadership roundtable that we've hosted in Charlotte. Now we're going to talk a little bit about how you can potentially utilize this framework from an ESG perspective to go back to your role in resilience or continuity and what aspects apply to what you are doing, right? And so my perspective, clearly Vanessa Matthews, not on as follows perspective, is that enterprise risk management is capturing and identifying what your risks are, um, what your con controls are, what are your threats, what are the challenges that you are having. But in my opinion, your business continuity program should really be centered around those risks. Those are the top things that you have as an organization. And if you don't have an enterprise risk management program that is um, truly encompassing the full aspect of risk, then that's obviously a gap that you guys can manage and figure out how do we resolve that. But one of those components that you should be tracking as a risk factor is talent. And it's attracting and retaining talent and ensuring that your business practices are ethical and that they are supporting causes that will continue to support your workforce as well as what you provide in the marketplace. And so the question is, from a BCP or a resilience perspective, how are you leveraging this point of criticality from a risk perspective, as well as in your ESG reports, to drive it home to the value that you provide from a, resili uh, from a resilience and a business continuity perspective? Secondly, business practices, right? And becoming and being transparent about what your practices are. Do you publish your impact reports or your diversity reports or what you're doing from a sustainability perspective? And how do you draw on those different reports to help you support the total picture that you provide from a resilience business continuity perspective? Demonstrating your company's values through measurable actions. Um, so, you know, we talk about, you know, values and core values a lot on this podcast. They've been the game changer for our business for the past few years. Um, but by following those ESG practices and measuring your progress, you can prove that there is action to back up those values that you have as an organization. And the same thing goes for your resilience and your continuity program. And then lastly, for companies who have investors, right? The contingency that you want to make sure that you have in place is how are we protecting the assets or the investments that the investors care about? And what way are we doing that? And so here's my perspective. Um, <laughs> corporate directors care about what business continuity and resilience people care about. And at a board level, they have visibility to your top risks. If you're publicly traded, you have a 10K report. If you're not, hopefully there is a risk committee at your board level. The gap that we see is that business continuity and resilience typically is not in that conversation and they're not at that table. And so what are the other ways that business continuity and resilience people can elevate the scope, the work, the challenges to a board level? One of the things that one of our clients did is they joined the National Association of Corporate Directors and they started to get in the room with corporate directors. Because those are the people who tell your CEO what's important and what's not. So again, thinking outside the box and being strategic about how do you leverage the resources that we have, et cetera, to do what needs to be done. So anyway, I hope that this has helped to shed some light on ESG um, and how those things may work for you and your organization. If it's something that you are already doing or you want to look more, more into, please feel free to leave, to leave comments or to send us a note on LinkedIn. A lot of this information and research also came from the Global Risk Management Institute. So we'll be sure to also drop this link in the show notes for you. Look out for future episodes. Thank you for listening to the Business Resilience Decoded podcast brought to you by Asphalus Advisors and Disaster Recovery Journal. Make sure you check out the show notes for this episode to see all the upcoming events, programs, and ways we can support you. Make sure you subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts, leave us a review, and share it with a friend. Thanks again, and I'll talk to you in the next episode.